historian, um, and I'm also a theoretical archaeologist. So I edit the Journal of World Prehistory um, and uh, see the, the broad range of information that comes in from archaeology, which is um, the way in which, I mean, I'm a firm believer that, that, that archaeology is actually uh, relevant um, because, just like history, uh, knowing our own past, knowing where we have come from, is a critical factor in planning for the future, knowing uh, where we may be going, where technology may be leading us, or where we may want uh, to be led, uh, and what we want to develop um, with it. Now, there are really two, I want to begin, I suppose, um, talking about two different sides to uh, what it is to be human, biology and culture. And this is, I suppose, uh, we're going to spend a little time looking at this, because uh, this is the data for uh, cranial enlargement um, on, this, on this scale here. You can see uh, brain size in millilitres, because it doesn't tell you anything about brain organisation. And here on the log scale at the bottom, uh, we can see <coughs> 10 million years ago, 1 million years ago, 100,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. And what we can see over here is a, uh, a small hominin, that's the word we use nowadays for a, a bipedal ape, something walking on two legs, probably at this stage not a, a so-called committed terrestrial biped, but swinging in the trees, doing a bit of brachiating, going up into the trees at night, but also walking around. That one there, uh, uh, Sahoanthropus chadensis, is one of a, a couple of known from uh, about between 4.8 and about 6 million years ago. The other one is uh, Ardipithecus ramidus, which we'll look at later. But their cranial capacity is pretty much where the, cranial, the lower end of the modern cranial capacity for a modern chimpanzee. Uh, and here you can see the, the range of uh, cranial capacity in the modern chimpanzee with the, with the shaded star showing the average. So this is a candidate for the um, last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. And while evolution in one direction went along flatlining, in this trajectory we can see that from uh, Sahelanthropus and, and Ardipithecus, we get a, a group of creatures known as the Australopithecines, the later ones that are very robust vegetable eaters known as the Paranthropines. And sometime just after 2 million years ago, maybe from as early as 2.2 million, but it's hard to know, uh, there's a lot of uh, classificatory argument about this, we have the emergence of genus Homo. Uh, these are creatures which uh, we label Homo rudolfensis and uh, uh, Homo habilis, although there may be a number of habilines, and, and then a group known as um, Homo agasta and its out of Africa form Homo erectus. And what you can see is that in a very short space of time between <coughs> two million years ago and about one and a half million years ago, cranial capacity more than doubles. There's a really very rapid rate of takeoff at a time when there's also a tremendous amount of species, um, rival species, I suppose, what, what one might call adaptive variation going on. And so by before a million years ago, we have creatures with cranial capacities which actually match the modern global human average, which is a little lower than you'll find in many of the many uh, older me medical books, which were just looking at European white and often male Populations, but if you graph the whole uh, averages, you'll find that uh, we're just a little over uh, 1200 mils. And uh, you'll also notice a, 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 an interesting trend, possibly in cranial size reduction, which I'm going to, in the last 30,000 years, which I'm going to talk about, talk about later. But parallel, in parallel with that development, is also the development of technology. And as archaeologists, we see that predominantly in the hard stuff, the things that will survive a million years, a hundred thousand years, ten thousand years very easily, and those are typically what we call lithics, the stone tools, and these come in um, uh, 
various varieties, and there are different ways of classifying them, but one of the standard ways is to look at them in terms of five modes. I'm not going to go into the technical details of that, but you begin with things called Alderwan choppers, uh, and end up with things called microliths. And they represent ever more efficient ways of getting edge, edge uh, cutting edge out of uh, a particular weight of, of, uh, of lithic, of particularly of flint, of chert and other, uh, other um, stones are used as well. And I'll, I'll talk a, a little more about that later. But essentially we can see the first chipstone tools actually come into use around about here. So they are actually already in use among the Australopithecines, and as we'll see, uh, since my book's been published, there's been some new evidence published in, uh, new data published in Nature, showing uh, the use of stones, for sm unmodified stones, for smashing meat bones up even earlier, at a, a pushing towards three and a half million years ago. So we've got a biological evolution, particularly this process of encephalization that makes us smart, and next to it we've got a process of technological evolution, in inverted commas, let's call it technological development. And the two things, it's, it's obviously tempting and in fact necessary to put these two things together and view them in relation to one another. But we can already see that there is a paradox that the standard view, and this is one of the main things I'm challenging in my book, the standard view is that we evolved through natural selection processes or processes of sexual selection, according to Darwin, to be intelligent. And once we had become intelligent, we were able to invent things. So the standard view is biology followed by technology. And what I'm arguing in principle is that the evidence for the use of facultative technology, whether found objects or uh, quite soon thereafter, modified standardized objects predates the massive intellectual takeoff that happens just after two million years ago. And empirically, that is fact. Uh, some archaeologists, respected colleagues and friends of mine, <coughs> Tim White, for example, who's a paleoanthropologist, is still holding out for some big-brained creature to turn up at 2.6 million years ago to account for the chipped stone tool technology. And I don't think that's necessary. Of course, science being what it is, I might have to come and eat humble pie if you invite me back in January, David. Do we know, you know, I don't know what this year, this season's excavations in East Africa will be turning up. And of course, uh, you know, uh, we're open to new data all the time. But this, um, this pattern of, in a sense, seeing the two things together, uh, technology and biological evolution, is, uh, is, as I say, it's very tempting, it's, it's necessary, but it can lead us into all sorts of trouble. Uh, this is a, an image that may be very familiar to uh, many of you here uh, from Ray Kurzweil's book uh, about the singularity, in which we can see him graphing uh, biological evolution and human technology along the same uh, on the same scale so he actually looks at life evolving um, the development of hominids language and then down at this end we have things like printing and the personal computer and the computer and so on at this log scale is there to show some acceleration in this process but what he's done is he's stuck the two things together and he does the same elsewhere in that book in which he implies that uh, intelligence in biology and intelligence in technology can be mapped onto each other now I'm not actually um, against this idea I'm not I'm, not, I'm, I'm a Kurzweil fan broadly there are some things where I uh, disagree with, with, with him but I'm just make, putting these slides up to make the point that, that this parallelism between the biological evolution and the technological evolution is 